Well, hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan Newman, Henry Hasler Research Fellow here at the Institute. Uh, thank you very much to Yusuf Amayad for uh, sponsoring this talk. Uh, very uh, thankful for his generosity. Um, Ludwig von Mises uh, was a true genius, and we can certainly see that on display in his magnum opus, Human Action. Uh, the book is cohesive, thorough, and systematic, and yet each sentence, paragraph, and page is pregnant with opportunities for scholars to expand and clarify. In my talk, I want to show uh, one example of this by taking a close look at uh, just a few pages of Human Action in Chapter 6 on uncertainty. Uh, the title of the talk is a phrase uh, Mises used to describe the fact that all action involves uncertainty. Peter Klein often cites this quote in his uh, Mises University lecture on, on entrepreneurship, and he got close to doing it uh, this time around as well. Um, and it highlights the general sense of entrepreneurship that's a, a part of all human action. Uh, so the full passage is, uh, the term entrepreneur, as used by catalactic theory, means acting man exclusively seen from the aspect of uncertainty inherent in every action. In using this term, one must never forget that every action is embedded in the flux of time and therefore involves a speculation. The capitalists, the landowners, and the laborers are by necessity speculators. So is the consumer in providing for anticipated future needs. There's many a slip twixt cup and lip. Uh, so the idea is that since all action aims at the attainment of an end in the future, all action is inherently speculative. Uh, even actions that are the most immediately realizable, like bringing a cup to one's lip uh, for the sake of quenching thirst, uh, involve some amount of hazard that the desired end uh, will not be attained. So I want to take a close look at what Mises has to say in chapter six about um, uncertainty. And as is uh, per usual for Mises, he starts with some fundamental questions. And so he addresses this question, why is the future unpredictable? He says, natural science does not render the future predictable. It makes it possible to foretell the results to be obtained by definite actions. Almost seems like those two sentences are contradictory, but they're not, as we'll see. But it leaves impredictable two spheres, that of insufficiently known natural phenomena and that of human acts of choice. Our ignorance with regard to these two spheres taints all human actions with uncertainty. Apodictic certainty is only within the orbit of the deductive system of a prioristic theory. So then after this, Mises uh, gives us a list of modes of dealing with the future. And I thought that this list was pretty interesting and I tried to think about what he's trying to convey uh, with, this th with this list. Uh, he says that gambling, engineering, and speculating are three different modes of dealing with the future. And I, uh, we'll go into more detail with these so we don't need to read the, the full quote uh, for each one. But the idea is that he's distinguishing between di different things that we might do in anticipation of future events. So how, how, does, how do we deal with the future when the outcome is uh, determined by various causes? And how do we deal with the future when we have different levels of control or confidence in our ability to control the outcome? So the, it's gambling, engineering, and speculating. Those are the three things that he lists. So gambling, he says the gambler knows nothing about the event, uh, about the event on which the outcome of his gambling depends. All he knows is the frequency of a favorable outcome of a series of such events. So the idea is uh, like throwing dice. The gambler knows that there's a one out of six chance that a certain number will arise. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the extent of his knowledge. He doesn't know uh, that the next time the, the dice is rolled, uh, that a, certain, a precise number will arise, but he knows on average how, how many times that number will arise over a bunch of different throws. So that's that's gambling. It has to do with physical forces. It has to do with uh, 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 material, not non-human factors, basically. Um, and the idea is that the gambler does not have control over the outcome, the specific outcome. Uh, there's engineering is up next, and Mises says that engineering is similar to gambling in that we're dealing with non-human factors. But in, in engineering, there's a certain level, there's a lot more control that's being exercised uh, by the actors. So Mises says, the engineer, on the other hand, knows everything that is needed for a technologically satisfactory solution of his problem, the construction of a machine. As far as some fringes of uncertainty are left in his power to control, he tries to eliminate them by taking safety margins. Of course, he can never eliminate altogether the element of gambling present in human life, 
but it is his principle to operate only within an orbit of certainty. He aims at full control of the elements of his action. So here the idea is that the actor perceives that, that he has a lot of control over the stuff that he's dealing with and he's trying to achieve a desired outcome. Uh, putting gears together in a machine using levers and his knowledge of physical laws to try to, pr try to make this machine do something that he wants it to do. And then in a, the other mode of dealing with the future is categorically different from these other two. Uh, it's speculating. And here, the, one of the, at least one of the determinants of the future outcome is other humans acting. It's other, other people making their own choices. Mises says the necessity to adjust his actions, this, um, on the part of the speculator, to other people's actions makes him a speculator for whom success and failure depend on his greater or lesser ability to understand the future. And so Mises says that there's gambling inherent in all of life, but also every action is inherently speculative. So there's some overlap. Whenever we look at particular actions, particular activities that, that, we, that we do, there's going to be some overlap in, in these modes of dealing with the future. On gambling in particular, Mises has some interesting examples. He talks about, he talks about viper bites and lightning strikes. Uh, so he says that this uh, element of, of gambling is, it pervades all of life. Uh, every man banks on good luck, for example. He counts upon not being struck by lightning and not being bitten by a viper. So this is, this is like, you know, a comet is heading towards Earth. It's something that, it's non-human, so the vipers and the, the lightning, it's not human-caused. It's not, uh, it's all, it's all non-human factors that are, that are uh, involved here. Um, and some of these things we can group into classes. And so we have enough repeated experiments, enough uh, experience with these things where we can we can say that these events that we've experienced in the past, it seems like they belong to a class, which means that we can assign probabilities based similar to the, the rolls of the, of the dice. <clears throat> he says a man can remove some of the crematistic consequences of such disasters and accidents by taking, out, uh, by taking out insurance policies. So if we can group them together in classes, then we can use actuarial methods to calculate a premium. Uh, but some things, it's not like everything that's in the natural world of, is something that we can say belongs in a certain class. It's going to be difficult for us to do that. So it'd be very hard to do that with viper bites, right? Because, because there's not a large enough sample size, at least in, in this area. With engineering, uh, once again, it's with physical stuff, physical factors. Uh, so in that sense, it's like gambling. But here the distinction is that there's a lot more control exercised by the actor uh, and more confidence in the outcome. Uh, so engineering involves dealing with non-human forces and materials. The difference between engineering and gambling is the level of certainty about specific outcomes. The engineer has practical certainty even though, as Mises acknowledged, he can never eliminate altogether the element of gambling present in human life. He have this picture of like an engineer making a machine and then a viper bites him or something. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so engineers uh, produce, desired, uh, produce a desired outcome based on technological knowledge within an orbit of certainty. So there's an emphasis on the part of Mises uh, that has to do with the, the actor's subjective understanding of of what of his activity. So the idea is that the if the actor believes that he has a lot of control over the outcome, then it counts as, as engineering. Has a lot of control, but also that it's non-human factors that are determining the outcome. So uh, I was noticing another similarity between gambling and engineering, and that is uh, that the way that we acquire the knowledge that helps us deal with these sorts of scenarios uh, the, the method is the same, and it's the scientific method. It's repeated experimentation. So how does, how does the gambler know the, the frequency, the probability distribution of, of different outcomes? Uh, and that's through a large number of, of trials, and then you see what happens, and you uh, find some regularities. You calculate the frequencies. Uh, the same thing can be applied to the engineer's knowledge of the physical sciences. So we use the scientific method to discover these physical laws of the universe, and that's the engineer uses that information to help him construct the machine. Okay, speculating. Totally different, mainly or for a couple reasons. One reason is because we're dealing with humans, and we've seen in many of the lectures uh, over the past couple of days, uh, 
how important this was for Mises. Uh, so gambling and engineering involve non-human factors, but speculation or entrepreneurship involves fellow, fellow men acting on their own behalf. So if we, we can use uh, the scientific method to help us acquire knowledge about the interaction of physical things, non-human things, uh, we, and it's, we're going to see that it's ill-suited for uh, the knowledge that we would need to deal with the future when it deals with other people making their own choices. And so here, we, as we've heard, praxeology and understanding uh, help us here. It's the main way that we can acquire this knowledge that will help us deal with the future when it has to do with other people making their choices. So class probability and the scientific method and repeated experiments will not give us universal laws of human action, uh, uh, and they cannot give us 100% certain predictions about humans will behave, but they can be used with some humility. And some of the uh, other presenters have mentioned this, where it, it's not like uh, th there's absolutely no room for econometrics at all. It, the proper way to think about it is that econometrics will not allow us to discover um, praxeological laws. It will not allow us to discover laws, universal time invariant laws about human action. Uh, but we, we could use, I mean, theoretically, we could use some econometric models to uh, think about an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur could, could see that uh, in the summers in Auburn, it's quite hot. And so based on the uh, daily temperature fluctuations or the seasonal temperature fluctuations, maybe selling ice cold lemonade in the summer is a better idea as, a, as opposed to doing it in the winter. And, and so this is uh, the formulation of that model is going to depend on the entrepreneur's understanding as well. Uh, but the point is, the entrepreneur would have some humility there. It's, it's not like the entrepreneur is thinking, I've got a rock solid, 100% certain uh, idea about exactly how many cups of lemonade will be sold if the temperature is X, right? But there's going to be some humility there. Okay, so I was thinking about what makes each of these modes of dealing with the future different from each other. And I, I saw Mises uh, implying a two-by-two two matrix here. Um, so on the, the rows, we have what's determining the outcome. Is it non-human factors and materials, or is it human action? And, so, and then the columns is the level of control that the actor perceives that he has when he's engaging in this activity. So in the, we'll start in the top right. So gambling means that the, the actor has limited or no control, if it's a fair game, no control, right, over the outcome. Uh, but the outcome is based on non-human factors. It's the, it's the dice uh, or it's the viper bites or the lightning strikes. And then moving to the left, we have engineering. And here Mises says that the actor is operating in the orbit of certainty, he says. So the engineer has high, a high level of control or high level of confidence that by arranging the, the parts of the, of the machine in a certain way that he will achieve a certain outcome. So both of those are the, this is the top row with the non-human factors and materials. And then down in the bottom, we have the human action. Other, other people making their own choices is the determinant of the outcome. And we can think about the, like the pure entrepreneur, um, the, the mere bearing of uncertainty is having limited control over the outcome. And, and so I would put speculation uh, or investment, entrepreneurship, and all action when we're just thinking about dealing in the pure sense of dealing with the fact that other people are going to make choices. But then there's this hole, right? So then there's this question mark. So what would go in this category where there's an orbit of certainty or attempted high level of control, but the outcome is based on human action? Oh, you have a... <laughs> Oh, you're, you're, you're exactly right. It's social engineering. <laughs> so, um, so actually, in this same passage, Mises talks about uh, social engineering. He doesn't list it as a mode of dealing with the future. We saw he only listed gambling, engineering, and, and speculating. But he actually, there's a whole paragraph in this same section where he's talking about social engineering. He says, it's customary nowadays to speak of social engineering, like planning, this term is a synonym for dictatorship and totalitarian tyranny. The idea is to treat human beings in the same way in which the engineer treats the stuff out of which he builds bridges, roads, and machines. The social engineer's will is to be substituted for the will of the various people he plans for the use of his uh, of the 
uh, to use for the construction of his utopia. And so you can see there's actually a lot of similarity with the quote about what the engineer is doing. The, instead of the construction of the machine, it's the uh, construction of a utopia. And so I, I consider this a sort of extreme case um, when there's a higher level of control uh, where you're urging people to do something that you want them to do. Uh, but I, I was thinking that there could be some softer versions of this. So uh, we could think about uh, like persuasion or marketing, where you were trying to use your own uh, rhetoric, you know, images, advertisements, that sort of thing, to try to influence other people to change their behavior, to do something that you want them to do. I'm not saying that every advertiser is a, is a social engineer, right? But it's the same category of thing where you are, you are trying to make other people do something else and then there's just different levels of, of coercion involved. And so that, that completes the two by two matrix. Um, I, I'm not saying that this was in the mind of Mises, but it sort of helps us organize what, uh, what he was saying. So the... The social engineering was a bonus uh, category that he gave us, uh, but he, he actually also gave us some other categories in this same section, in the same uh, chapter. Uh, and the bonus categories that he gives are based on uh, overlapping ideas. Uh, so he says that there's this uh, combination, this possibility of the combination of betting or speculating and gambling. He says sometimes betting and gambling are combined. The outcome of horse racing depends both on human action, on the part of the owner of the horse, the trainer, and the jockey, and on non-human factors, the qualities of the horse. So, and then uh, before I continue, I just want to remind you that the way that Mises was uh, talking about engineering and gambling and speculating, what he was he was putting himself in the shoes of the people who were doing it. So it's the what knowledge do they have? What expectations and confidence do they have? Uh, what, what factors are they taking into account when they are dealing with the future? So he continues, most of those risking money on the turf are simply gamblers, but the experts believe they know something by understanding the people involved. As far as this factor influences their decision, they are betters. Furthermore, they pretend to know the horses. They make a prognosis on the ground of their knowledge about the behavior of the classes of horses to which they assign the various competing horses. So far, they are gamblers. So if you're taking into account uh, just the qualities of the horses, you're a gambler because horses aren't human. If you're taking into account uh, the, the jockeys and their skill and the trainers, th those are humans, uh, which means that you're speculating. You're taking into account human action as a, as a determinant of the outcome of the race. So uh, Mises also mentioned some other uh, combinations, uh, one that's uh, pretty clear that would be in the, uh, between the top two is he talked about cases in which there's uh, uncertainty or lack of knowledge about whether a certain event fits within a class. Uh, and he gives the example of a doctor who's uh, giving a medical prognosis. Um, and as the, as the doctor learns more about the patient, uh, the patient's unique circumstance, he's able to give a, a, a different prognosis based on those characteristics. And so if with a limited amount of information, the doctor would put the patient in a much larger class, but then once the doctor learns that the patient is younger or has, uh, has good health in all of the other areas, except for the one disease that, that this patient has, uh, then that gives the doctor some extra information that allows him to refine which class this patient belongs to and can offer a different prognosis. Uh, one thing that's interesting, uh, Mises also mentions that um, if the doctor knows that he is the one who's going to be treating the patient, then that would also alter the doctor's prognosis. So he, he might say, oh, if that, if that other doctor is treating the patient, those are bad odds. But if you come to me, then you'll be okay. <laughs> uh, so it, once again, it's all in the mind of, of, of the actor. Oh, and um, some other areas of overlap that I was thinking about, some of these got quite fanciful when I was you know, just dreaming about what could, what are some overlap areas here, um, is uh, middle, military strategy. Uh, military strategy is mentioned by Mises in a few different cases, a uh, few different parts of human action, um, uh, but also in some of his other writings. Uh, but interestingly, in in Human Action, on pages 824 to 825, he actually talks about how the military strategist uses uh, experience uses uh, knowledge of how 
uh, armies have been arranged in the past to, and how that determined the outcome of the, of the battle, for example. And so where I, I think the military strategy might fit in the two by two matrix is, is straddling the social engineering and the engineering aspect. And the reason why I was thinking about the, like the phalanx, the like arranging humans in a certain way to achieve a desired outcome. So you're literally, you know, like constructing a machine, but in this case, it's the arrangement of humans, the soldiers that are in the battle. Uh, you could also think about choreography, dancing, acrobatics. These are humans using their own bodies and somebody designing the arrangement of these humans in a certain way to achieve a desired outcome. It's sort of like a split on the, on the left-hand side. One other uh, uh, activity or yeah, one other activity that I thought was sort of a blend of these different uh, uh, scenarios and modes of dealing with the future was the ownership function of the entrepreneur, which Peter Klein mentioned in uh, his talk yesterday. Um, so it, the entrepreneur is not just bearing uncertainty. So that, that might be like, we could call it like the pure sense of what entrepreneurship is, just bearing uncertainty. Um, in like a general sense, that's the aspect that pervades all of, of action. Uh, but the entrepreneur is also owning things and deploying things and making labor contracts. And if you think about what the entrepreneur is doing when they're making a labor contract, they're trying to get this other person that they're employing to do something, right? So in that sense, it's like the, the social engineering. I want you to act in a certain way. I want you to perform these, perform these duties. Uh, and also the entrepreneur is deciding like how to arrange the factory. Like this machine should go here. This machine should go there. This these people doing this job should be in this location. And so in that sense, it's, there's like an engineering aspect of putting the physical stuff together in a certain way to achieve a desired outcome. So in that sense, the ownership function of the entrepreneur straddles a few of these um, modes of dealing with the future. Okay, so let's contrast this with Samuelson. I put this in here for a couple of reasons. One, because uh, Dr. Holcomb mentioned that uh, if... If you don't understand the math, then you don't understand Samuelson. And so this is just a good example of that. I just want to show that he's, he's right. But I also want to show that Patrick Newman is wrong. <laughs> because in his talk, he said that nobody ever quotes Paul Samuelson. And so here, I've quoted, <laughs> quoted Paul Samuelson. So maybe we should you know, put everything that Patrick Newman says into, into doubt. <laughs> um, so this is a totally different way of thinking about... But by the way, in this section... Samuelson is talking about, he calls it probabilistic choice. He's talking about the way humans deal with the future uh, in different, yeah, in different capacities. But notice that this is totally different than what Mises is doing. This is totally divorced from reality, right? Totally divorced from any sort of what we understand about, about human experience. Okay, so to getting closer to some con conclusions from this, what can we draw from this? How do we deal with, how do we deal with the future? Uh, obviously, there's some methodological implications here. When human action is a determinant of a future outcome, class probability will have limited or no application. No application if you're trying to figure out something with apodictic certainty, right? So uh, we, we, can't use, we can't use quantitative methods to, to come up with something that is a constant relationship in human action. Um, <clears throat> as such, quantitative methods are ill-suited for economics. It's ill-suited for analyzing the entrepreneur, even if the entrepreneur can use quantitative methods as he's running his business. Uh, we can't use it to predict human behavior with certainty. However, uh, quantitative methods are appropriate for natural sciences. Uh, engineering or calculating probabilities for games of chance, perfectly suitable for, for those activities, for those modes of dealing with the future. Um, and then as, as, uh, as a... Uh, um, so on the flip side of these modes of dealing with the future, you can see how different methods of, of acquiring knowledge uh, are going to be more relevant or, or better suited for these different modes of dealing with the future or thinking, making sense of the ways that we've dealt with the future in the past. I mean, there's a lot of back to the future here. Um, so we, we can use praxeology. That's one way that we can... Uh, predict the future. And uh, Dr. Salerno had some excellent uh, excerpts from Mises where Mises was talking about uh, we can use praxeology to help us predict the outcomes of certain interventions. Uh, of course, uh, we can't have like quantitative predictions. Uh, there's going to be a certain level of pre 
precision that we don't have, but we can at least see the pattern of, of what's going to happen when you increase the money supply or when you uh, artificially lower interest rates or if you remove market prices for factors of production. So we can predict the patterns of, of what's going to happen as a result of that. We can use understanding, and here we're inferring definite means and ends of our fellow men. So I, I see somebody else doing something, and I can sort of make sense of that uh, because I'm also a human, right? And, and uh, other lecturers have, have done the same thing. Uh, uh, Dr. Murphy mentioned the, the drinking of the water, and he actually didn't slip between the, the cup the, or the bottle in his lip. Um, he also kept the cap on, so he was playing it safe. That's the safety margin from the engineer's perspective. Uh, but we can do this. So since we're also human, we, we experience life in the same, similar ways that other people do. Uh, it means that we can ascribe ends and means. We can make some sense of the motivations that other people have. And this is especially useful when we're uh, trying to make sense of the past, trying to make sense of things that we've seen other people do, or policies that were implemented in the past. Finally, we can also use experiment, uh, repeated experimentation to, to acquire knowledge to help us predict the future and make sense of the past. So we do something over and over and discover regularities. This is what helps us figure out the frequencies of, of certain outcomes uh, when you're dealing with the natural phenomena, with the, with the physical stuff. So uh, Mises says that uh, among these different methods of acquiring knowledge, uh, Mises says the scope of understanding is the mental grasp of phenomena which cannot be totally elucidated by logic, mathematics, praxeology, and the natural sciences to the extent that they cannot be cleared up by all these sciences. So the understanding is the one that sort of fills the gaps, fills the voids that what we can't discover by praxeology and and experiments, understanding is what, is what helps us make sense. So in conclusion, in these few pages of human action, Mises has uh, carefully categorized the modes of dealing with the future. These categories involve a distinction between phenomena that are determined by physical laws and phenomena that are determined by human action. Mises also comments on the level of control or confidence that the actor has over the means and the outcome. But unlike economists devoted to quantitative methods and mathematical models of human action, Mises had humility about what economics and praxeology can say with certainty and what other methods can allow us to say about how the world works. Mises' humility and careful observance of the boundaries of economics, however, did not handicap his project. It allowed him to construct a powerful and epistemologically sound system a system that has proven to be amazingly fruitful, not just for Mises, but for scholars in Mises' own time today and going on into the future. Uh, and for that reason, human action is an incredible gift, and we should be very grateful. Thank you. <laughs>